We live in a world where so many feel hopeless. And it's not surprising when we see the world around us, is it? Some two years ago now, we saw a sudden change from that time of peace in Europe and conflict was back on the continent. The time when Russia suddenly invaded Ukraine and it brought home insecurities to, to many. War, yes, was always there around the world, but it brought it closer to home. Somehow those conflicts in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Myanmar, in Sudan, and wherever else, don't seem quite so home to us as when we see that conflict in Europe. And suddenly it seemed to affect people much closer to home. And then we cast our mind back to last October. And suddenly, overnight, there was a, a mass attack on Israel. And hundreds of people were taken captive and thousands were killed. And Israel's response was dramatic and many saw as indiscriminate. And it resulted, and we still see it, is persecution and intolerance on, on both sides of the argument. And we seem powerless to stop any of the problems around. And yet these conflicts have come on top of other problems around the world. It's some four years ago now when we came across coronavirus. Sudden and overnight, we were locked into our own homes, facing social distancing. Face masks became everyday terms and it was normal behavior. And we felt powerless to do anything about it. We had to trust what the scientists were telling us, even if they didn't agree on everything they were saying. And we didn't really understand what was happening. And we were hopeless to do anything about it. And into that, we see the rise of the far right, who want to take back control not quite sure what control they're, they're talking about or, or from whom or to whom. But to rise in racism and sectarianism, we're not all together. Blaming our own problems on others. Particularly the, the faceless unknown. We come across phrases like I'm not a racist, but I don't want all these foreigners. And it rises, it brings about various conspiracy theories. During the coronavirus, we had the anti-vax movement who didn't trust the vaccines. We see conspiracies that have gone back many years people who claim that the moon landings were fake. People claimed that COVID was caused by 5G. And we've seen recently people claiming that London is controlled by Islamists or that Israel was behind those attacks that devastated their country last October. And then the other side of the argument, the far left are on the rise also anti-establishment because society is not helping in the problems around and the environmentalist movement in a recent survey half of young people think that humanity is doomed in the largest study of its kind researchers found that the, 
The climate crisis is leaving young people around the world feeling frightened and with a sense of betrayal that their government are not doing enough to tackle the issue. More than 45% of young people said their feelings about climate change negatively impact their daily life and functioning. And 75% they, they feel the future is frightening. With 56% in agreement with the statement that humanity is doomed. And it leads to disillusionment. Feeling that the individual is powerless to do anything about it. Everything is done to the benefit of the, the rich and the powerful. And the individual is being left behind. And people don't trust anything they're told. We live in a, a post-truth society. Relating to or denoting circumstances in which the objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than those which appeal to emotions and personal belief. And in this era of post-truth politics, it's easy to cherry pick data and come to whatever conclusion you desire. Appealing to the emotions rather than facts. And if the facts get in the way, then we find other facts to follow them. And whilst this has been described as a, a contemporary problem, there is a possibility there's been long part of a political life. We think back to the, the novel 1984, where George Orwell cast a, a world in which the state changes historic facts, the historic records to fit its daily propaganda goals of the day. And we see the rise of deep fakes, which again, put into question what we see, not being able to trust anything that it appears, that it is really as it appears. And amongst these, we look to the leaders of the world. And so many feel that they don't have the answers they claim to have. We see a rise in nationalism. The UKIP reform group in the UK. Anti-immigrant, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, all on the rise. In America, we see Trump trying to make America great again. And throughout Europe, we see the rise of the far right parties of Geert Wilders in the Netherlands, Marine Le Pen in France, the AFD in Germany, and so many more similar parties. And fundamentalism, whether it's Islamic State and their groups or the US Christian fundamentalists, without being able to tolerate anyone else. And amongst that, even in the mainstream, we find those moving to the extremes. President Xi in China, President Putin in Russia, President Erdogan in Turkey. And even in this country, we, we see people like Liz Truss and Suella Braverman moving to the right. And Benjamin Netanyahu with his Far right government in Israel. And the left, we see the extremists of Jeremy Corbyn and now George Galloway re emerging. And we see no hope. The news and opinion shaped by social media and our closed group of friends, we don't want to tolerate anyone else's views. 
apart from the influences who are, are paid to shape our opinions. You see, there's a, a lack of a world vision. Everybody looking for their own part of it. There's a need for a world leader in a global world. You see, the leaders of this world have no real control, do they? All countries have their own central bank to enforce their rules. But the governments need to follow the rules of the international bankers if they're going to remain competitive. We saw what happened with Liz Truss's mini budget when she tried to go her own way. And many claim that the bankers have more power than the elected politicians. And multinational companies can threaten to move their business and jobs to another country if the government don't cooperate with them. And crime is very much now a, a global problem. It can be instigated from anywhere in the world. And the same with the environment. Pollution and environmental damage doesn't stop at a political border. It requires multinational cooperation. And so we see the problems that these leaders of this world don't have any answers. And people feel so hopeless. So is there any answer for us? Well, the Bible claims that there is. You see, there's going to be a world leader to tackle the problems of the world. The Bible promises a worldwide kingdom to come with Jesus as the king of that world. Let's look at some of the passages from the Bible and, and see what the Bible says about that time to come. I'm going to read from a few passages. Um, you're welcome to, to look them up, but um, I shall read them for you, perhaps to save a little bit of time. In First Timothy in chapter 6 and verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power for evermore. You see, the Bible promises that this Lord Jesus, who rose from the dead and went to heaven, will return as King of Kings, King of the whole world. And he won't be some distant ruler who doesn't care about the people within the, the world. He is there to defend the poor. Psalm 72 says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and he shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. You see, Jesus is going to be there to defend the poor, to care for the small person. There won't be that hopelessness. He will be all powerful to stand up against the tyrants around. As Paul said when he wrote, to the Philippians, he said, 
Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And this Jesus is not going to be a fake. He's going to be trustworthy. As John the Baptist bear record to him. And he said, rather in, in John chapter, chapter eight, he said, um, we read, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, Jesus is going to be true. He's going to be honest. We can trust everything he stands for. He's going to be an immortal ruler, to rule forever. There won't be anyone to, to take his place. And he will be righteous, upright. As Paul says when he, he wrote his letter to the Corinthians. And he said, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You see, Jesus always did that which was right in God's eyes. Always fulfilling his father's pleasure. Always doing those things which are right. And he will return to continue that right ways, judging the world in righteousness. Isaiah says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. You see, that's the judgment we want, isn't it? That true and honest judgment. So that he can see who is telling the truth. There will be no miscarriages of justice. You see, Jesus will be all knowing of the truth. And that's a time which we can look forward to, a hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus told us that that time will be coming soon and not to worry about all the distress we see around us, when the disciples asked him about those times to come, he talked to them in Luke chapter 21 of the time when nations will be in distress, unable to deal with those situations which they find. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. You see, we see nations in distress today, don't we? They haven't got the answers to the problems we see around us. 
and it's possible that the sun and the moon and the stars are referring to political upheavals. But men's hearts are failing them for fear as it goes on. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And hearts failing for fear, literally too scared to carry on, worried about what is happening in the world, scared to death. And that seems to be what's happening today, isn't it? People are literally scared of what's happening in the world. And when this is true, Jesus says, don't worry, that will be the time when I return. And when they shall see, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. That's the time to look forward to. And as we see all the problems in the world today, we know that God has an answer. And not to worry, but to lift up your heads for redemption is coming. And so what will that time look like? Let's turn to that, that chapter we looked at, we read at the start in Micah chapter four. Pictures of that kingdom to come when Jesus comes back to put to an end all the problems of this world. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it, and many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of Jacob, and he will teach of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And people will literally say, We want to go up to Jerusalem to learn of God's ways. We want to follow the true ways. And Jesus will judge between the nations. He shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. And those times of peace are what God promises. A peace worldwide where people will sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts have spoken it. What a time that is to look forward to. There will be no more need for armaments. Everybody will live in peace and safety and no one will make them afraid the downtrodden will be heard i will assemble her that halteth, and i will gather her that is driven out and her that i have afflicted and i will make her that halted a remnant and her that was cast off a strong nation and the lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion, from henceforth forevermore. You see, that's the promise that God has made. The world has a hope that mankind can learn from his mistakes, that everything will work out in the end. Mankind can improve. Education and technology can solve all the world's ills. But the Bible tells us that's not true. 
And if we're honest with ourselves, the Bible's message is quite right. As Paul said when he wrote to Timothy, he said, there will be terrible times in the last days. <clears throat> People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but in the denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. You see, times aren't getting better, are they? Things in the world are just getting worse. People are not getting better. They're just puffed up in their own knowledge, thinking their knowledge allows them to do what they want and to get away with it. What is right in their own eyes, as the Bible describes it. Thinking they know better than God. As Jude said, in the last days there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. It's a godless world where most people are not interested in God at all. They want to follow their own ways. As Jesus said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You see, for so many, they don't want to follow God's ways. And if they don't follow God's ways, then there is no hope for mankind and for this world. The Bible correctly foretolds the worlds that we live in today. Far more accurately than the, the world leaders of today's over optimistic predictions. And the Bible foretells that there is a hope in God's ways. You see, God called Abraham and his descendants as his chosen people, not because they were better than others, but as he said when he caused the words in Deuteronomy to written, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore unto your fathers, have the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the hand, out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will be not slack to him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. You see, we have that choice, don't we? Do we want to be in those that are chosen by God or those that hate God? You see, we see so many problems around us in the world, but God has promised that his son will return. 
less than a hundred years ago, the nation of Israel did not exist as a nation. God had promised that he would scatter them throughout the world. They would be persecuted. But he also promised that they would return one day to their land. An unlikely promise fulfilled in modern times. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make them afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not to leave thee altogether unpunished. See, God always keeps his promises. Today's world leaders are unable to keep the promises they make from one day to the next. But God always can and always will. And only through God and through the return of his son are the problems of this world able to be solved. And is there a hope for mankind? Through the leads of this world, no. But through God and through his son, there is a hope for mankind.